This is Have You Met? My guest today suffered a devastating rugby injury that pushed him into a downward spiral of alcoholism and depression. Eventually, he managed to fight these demons, thanks in no small part to running and ultramarathons. A few years ago, he appeared as a participant on UK Channel 4's SAS, Who Dares Wins, a brutal reality show where a bunch of super fit humans are tested both physically and mentally by a group of former Special Forces soldiers. James was one of the last people standing. He's since taken his fitness to new heights and recently ran 145 miles in one go without stopping for more than a quick bite to eat. Have you met James Gwinnett? So, James, tell me about what kind of life you were leading before your injury. So, uh, a good one, I would say, is the uh, is probably the, uh, the the long and the short of it. Um, yeah, I grew up in a very very close, loving family. Parents still together. Um, younger brother who um, never had a sort of sibling sibling rivalry with. Uh, we're very very close and remain very close to this day. Um, dad worked incredibly hard to put uh, the two of us through a very expensive public school. Um, mum was a housewife and devoted every single waking second to helping us do our homework or ferry us backwards and forwards from extracurricular, whatever classes it was. Um, yeah. And uh, toddled up, did, did well in school, got good grades, toddled off to a good university, Durham, um, played, played rugby uh, throughout um yeah played work played rugby very seriously what position played, were you i was a second row first fifth uh sorry um second row number eight yeah okay and and you played for durham university so yeah i um i played played at school again good good rugby school toddled off to new zealand did the whole gap year thing um got some experience playing against enormous maoris on the other yeah. side of the world nice. came back to university and everyone was my size again and and found <laughs> it found it easy um so played played first 15 for the for the, the university and it was good good standard um and then yep went through university i mean to be honest i i uh, i came out with a a 2-2 because i drank too much and played too much rugby, but I, I mean, it was fun and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't change things necessarily. Yeah. Um, and wound up playing, continued the, the, the rugby through what sort of started out as my professional career and worked my way up through the, uh, the league system, club league system up to a point where I was playing national league rugby and getting paid a bit of pocket money to do so so semi semi professional level uh and it was it was brilliant and and yeah. the trouble was it was in hindsight it was it was too brilliant um because that was it was my, that was my identity um and that's the, the sort of the crux of the um uh the the, the foundation of, of of the issues that that that, that um arose post what post the the injury will come on to um i was as i say second row uh, six foot five. I was about seventeen stone at the time, so big. I hate the phrase now, but alpha male, macho, yeah. one of the lads. Um, I was the. I wanted to be the fittest, the strongest, uh, and I also wanted to prove that I could down more pints than you after the uh, after the game every every week as well. And it was very much a case of everything was geared towards that Saturday afternoon and evening. So my whole routine, my weekly routine, despite the fact that I was working a full-time, full-time job, yeah. my weekly routine consisted of being in the prime condition that I possibly could be at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, all the training, all the weights, eating, um, everything that went into the, the, the diet, the calories, the protein, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the build up towards that Saturday afternoon game. And then the post-match, out with the lads, having a great time, being a drunken idiot, enjoying yourself, all part of that, again, a horrible bandied about phrase, but that banter, that rugby banter. But there's a, a camaraderie, huge, huge camaraderie that comes as yeah. part of being a team of that nature. And rugby in particular, I think probably more than any sport, um, because of the sort of the bruising, brutal nature of the, of the game, there's this concept that you, um, you go into battle with your yeah. with your teammates you bump and bruise each other for for 80 minutes and then you all come off feeling closer there's a bond formed and you all go and celebrate win or lose um 
it's uh, it's the sort of done thing afterwards. That everyone goes and have a few uh, few few beers to uh, to to continue that that bonding experience and ease the pain um, as well. Ease the pain, yeah, 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 definitely. Although the pain then is even worse on the Sunday morning <laughs> than, uh, than otherwise it might have yeah. been. But um, yeah, as a sort of twenty five year old, twenty eight year old um, rugby player, that that banter um, was always acceptable even if it consisted of drinking to the point of passing out and making an idiot out of yourself it was always a joke in uh in training on the tuesday tuesday evening or fred or george or whoever it was james was an idiot on saturday but wasn't it funny you know ha 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 we'll, we'll make it make a joke of it um but that yeah that was my that was my that was my identity that that all came crashing down um to an abrupt halt on the 9th of February, 2013. Um, I remember it vividly. I was, I was running across the, the pitch to, to make a cover tackle. One of the opponents was coming down the, coming down the wing. And I, I don't know why, but uh, you know, a lumbering second row was the, yeah. the last line of defence. And I flew headfirst into this, this guy as I had a thousand times over a 20 years of playing, playing the game. But he changed direction right at the last, right at the last second. So what should have been my shoulder, you know, you know, proper rugby tackling technique, what should have been my my shoulder flying into him ended up being my head, top of my head, mm. flew head first into his midriff. Both of us were, were, were moving at, at full pelt. Yeah. And um, the impact at the time, I had what we called a stinger. So this sort of like shooting, shooting pain down my, yeah. down my arm. And I thought, fortunately, I, I sat up. I thought, oh dear, that hurt. And um, he was down on over there, and I was sort of lying on the ground over here. And the physios came came running on to check out that we were okay after this ridiculous collision. Um, and she, the physio, sort of wobbled me and moved my arm around and she checked my head, and I was okay. Um, it's bizarre. The human body is an incredible piece of machinery, but mm. but bizarre at the same time. Um, I came off the pitch and 15 minutes later after an ice after putting an ice pack on it on my on my shoulder I wanted to come back on the come back on the field. We were playing um I say National League rugby we were trialing I think we were trialing a rolling subs um thing at the time. So I could sort of come on come off uh, again when I was um if I thought I was recovered. Now <laughs> excuse me now fortunately the physio saw a little bit of sense um and I can vividly remember that we were winning the game we were at home uh, against the league leaders um but we were winning so we were um all very, you know, very excited about this but winning comfortably so they the physio said look you don't need to go back on we've got the game wrapped up just take it easy and thank god she did um mm. but then for the next 48 hours I was fine and it was only on the, the Monday night at, well, middle of the night on the Monday night, so effectively the Tuesday morning, yeah. that I was lying in bed and I can only describe, I, can, I say I only describe, I cannot describe the pain. My entire body was absolute, was just aching head to toe, absolute mm. agony. And I knew from, a, you know, from years of bumps and bruises and, uh, and niggles and, um, and whatnot that that something was wrong uh and i i got up in the middle of the night and my my girlfriend at the time sort of was there and what, asked what the hell are you doing and i told her Look, I have, this is something wrong with me i have to go to hospital so she said oh, for god's sake don't be stupid i don't believe it you know anyway we, off we went walked into the local a and e two o'clock in the morning whatever time it was they gave me a couple of paracetamol uh, and told me to sit there. And four hours later, I had various different x-rays and then a CT scan. And long story short, I'd broken my neck. Jeez. And there was this fracture in my, my, my C6 vertebra, and which is right down at the base of, base of the neck. Uh, and as I say, you know, this was 48 hours after actually, after actually doing it. Um, mm. And my body, had, I don't know what it had done for, for those, no. those two days, but it, mm. whether it was adrenaline or like you say, I drunk enough to um, <laughs> ease the pain, I don't know. But suddenly my body just decided, right, that's it. I'm, I, you know, we're done. We're, we're going to yeah. get this sorted. And um, I remember the hospital went into, went into, I was pretty much the only person in A&E. 
at the time, obviously on a you know, middle of the night on a Tuesday morning. Um, but it basically meant that the entire A&E department, I can remember there was, because of the, the size of me, again, I was, I was um, put on a stretcher and had six nurses carrying me around the, uh, carrying me around the, uh, the department backwards and forwards between beds and x-rays and things like that. Um, so this was the whole hospital went into meltdown. I'm like, oh my God, this guy's broken his neck. What do we do? And I was sellotaped to a hospital bed with sellotape what? across my forehead like that really? so that I couldn't move my head left and right. I had to be, had to keep my head straight. Now, yeah. Again, bearing in mind that I'd been walking around. You've for two walked days, there. Yeah. yeah. And I'd walked into the hospital, <laughs> um, but they wanted to assess whether my fracture was stable or unstable. Eventually they decided it was stable. So I was sort of sent five days later, I should, I should say they sent, they mm. decided it was stable and they sort of sent me packing with a, a bag of morphine and, and whatnot. I was on so many drugs at the time that I had to take a drug to prevent the other drugs from corroding my stomach. Um, a meprazole? Uh, do you know what? I don't, I don't know. More, I just remember <laughs> lots of morphine. I was high as a kite for months. Surprised yeah. I'm not a morphine addict. I <laughs> the alcohol was what got me. I just as I say, I'm surprised it wasn't the morphine. Um, but so started this this spiral and basically I didn't, I didn't handle it well. I, I wasn't able to come to terms with this loss of identity. It was mm. the first time that I had seen myself as anything but this big invincible macho rugby guy. Whereas actually I was, I was now this weak, frail individual and I, and I, I just couldn't, couldn't compute it. Couldn't, couldn't handle that. Um, and also because of, I was, I was signed off work for three, three months, um, basically told not to do anything. And also yeah. because of the boredom, I, I just, I went, in inverted commas, I went mad. What did um, they tell you to do? Sorry to jump in. What did they, the hospital staff, what did they tell you to do? Was they off your feet or like just limited walking? What was I the... was, I was basically, I was allowed to walk around, but that was mm -hmm. about the limit of it. There was no strenuous exercise for yeah. three months none at all so i couldn't go for a couldn't go for a run i couldn't stay fit i couldn't lift weights um i couldn't do anything that that kept my my fitness levels at the level that they they were which was obviously high fitness level yeah. playing yeah playing a decent level of rugby um and i lost all of that routine all of that discipline that i talk about that the sort of weekly setup that that went towards that, that saturday afternoon um game i lost all of that i had no yeah. motivation to 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 maintain that over that that three month period and, and all your mates that. i suppose the camaraderie and, as well and i lost that exactly i lost those those saturday nights um bonding sessions i lost the the, Training. the feeling of 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 being part of the part of the gang, part of the, the wolf pack kind of, uh, kind of mentality, um, training together, et cetera, as I, as I said, a moment, moment ago, going into battle together, lost all of that. Mm. Um, and I started drinking during the day. Um, it seemed like a very innocent thing to do at the time. Um, as a, just something to pass the time, uh, I'll, I'll treat myself. This is how I thought about it in my head. I'll treat myself to a beer one 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 afternoon. Uh, the girlfriend, I, the ex girlfriend I mentioned, was off at work. I was sitting alone at, at home watching Friends on repeat on on the Dave TV channel, I think probably. Um, and one beer turned into two, turned into four, to, and there's just this spiral over a over a three month period. By by the end of it, I was putting away the best part of a bottle of gin a day. I think really and i'd always been a big drinker um i'd always been the one to do something silly and pass out or whatever it might be but again it was it was, it was banter wasn't it you know it was, all in the name of fun fun, fun right? thing to do exactly but yeah. when you're doing it on your own mm. in order to try and make yourself feel better um it's uh it's a problem unfortunately yeah yeah, yeah. So how did you get to that point where you realized like this is, this is out of control? That was three years later. So I went on this, I went on this um, tragic merry-go-round for three years. Um, I, the, the girlfriend at the time sort of realized that it was a problem and broke up with me. 
I refused to accept that it was a problem, um, continued to do it. I went back to work and I was able to, you know, hold down a job and, and that sort of, um, th- that made it okay in, in my mind, that sort of functioning, functioning aspect. Yeah. Um, but it got to the point where one, um, I, I was another, another girlfriend who was you know, struggling to put up with me. Um, she and I had a big, big fight. And I had, I'd been out actually after, after work and had a few drinks with, with colleagues and then, and then came home and she, she knew that I'd had a, a few too many and, and got upset with me. Um, and I didn't want to deal with, with, with an argument. So um, I stormed out of the flat, took a bottle of Jack Daniels with me mm. and um, checked myself into a, into a hotel room for the night. And I was just this poor, sad individual alone in a hotel room drinking Jack Daniels on my own. And I got through the whole bottle, um, having had pints beforehand, which I mean, is, is not some, not something I'm yeah. proud of. It just, it sort of puts things into, um, in, into perspective, the, uh, the sort of severity of the, uh, of the condition for want of a better word. Yeah. Um, but it was the next morning when it hit me, I was, I was sat at, um, sat in the restaurant and, and having breakfast in the, in the hotel, uh, the next morning. And I just had this, almost out of body experience where I, I sort of floated up outside of myself and looked down on this just pathetic individual, um, stinking of booze, struggling to eat his, his bacon, bacon and eggs, um, feeling sorry for himself. And I just thought I can't do this anymore. And I was Did you just actually out- experience it as an out of body thing? I'm, I'm not, fascinated I'm by not, that stuff. I'm not a particularly spiritual individual, yeah. but it's the only way I can describe it. Yeah. Um, like you, you were I looking sort down of saw it. myself yeah. and I had this, this well, absolute epiphany light bulb moment and it just hit me, bam, smacked me in the face. I can't do this anymore. Um, and I just resolved there and then that, that's it. Um, and the, it's funny how addiction is seen as a negative thing, but actually addressed in the right way can be flipped into a positive Although I suppose, you know, it depends on how you describe it. I, I like to, I'm not, I yeah. like to um, call it a, a healthy obsession rather than addiction now, but I became addicted to being sober. Mm-hmm. Um, and I attended AA meetings. I, uh, I read books. I went to hypnotherapy. I looked at YouTube videos. I went to seminars, workshops, uh, you name it. I did it. Um, Counselling. And... I, the, the AA program was was a sort of major major help in the um, in, in the opening um, six months or so um, because it gave me a gave me a focus. Um, but the, the the major turning point for me was was a, a month after I decided to quit drinking. I found myself so this was in March. A month later, so the, and three years after your injury, three years after the injury. So yeah. five, I've been been sober five and a, five and a half years now. So um, March 2016, I I'd made the decision to stop drinking. Uh, April 2016, one Sunday morning, I found myself watching the London Marathon, um, just the the, the 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 live coverage on TV, and I don't know why, but it, I got really emotional. I was I was crying my eyes out at the endeavor of, of these 40 50 however many thousand people putting themselves through hardship setting themselves a challenge the training involved the fancy dress the the atmosphere of the event etc cetera, etc cetera, all to prove to themselves that they were capable of taking on this supposedly impossible feat of running mm. a marathon and it's a hard thing to do. You know, I'm not going to take anything away from anyone who has ever run a marathon. It's 26 miles is a, a decent, decent slog. Yeah. Um, and having done nothing apart from drink myself silly for three years at the time, I, it seemed like an impossible thing to do. And I'm fascinated by this word, this, this word impossible. Um, but that was, that was the second light bulb moment. The first was giving up drinking. The second was that I needed to, to set myself this, a challenge, this, this challenge. And the challenge was running the, uh, the London marathon the following year. Wow. So had you, I had you done much to, running before that? No, this was it. I had apart Just from in, on a running around pitch. a rugby field, um, which is very much based on short sprints power. Yeah. Um, I had done no endurance running whatsoever. I, I don't think I'd even run a half marathon 
up to that yeah. point. I guess it set you up a bit though, because the nature of rugby, it's like you're always, if you're not running, you're jogging over somewhere else, aren't you? And yeah, yeah. Of, and there, there, and there's very much a sort of mindset, keep going element yeah. To, yeah. The, to the game. You know, you're overcoming physical um, yeah. stress, a, a physical adversity. And, and yeah. there is very much a, I'm sure we'll come onto this, but there's very much a pushing your mind in order to to complete that that sort of physical feeling, yeah. physical challenge element to the game of rugby. So I had that sort of competitive sportsman um, mindset that was there. But as yeah. I say, I've never run anything probably more than about ten kilometers okay. in, in one go. Wow. So just to clarify as well, before I let you carry on, no, um, were in the hospital and stuff, or, or after that, did they did you kind of have a realization that you're never going to play rugby again? Was that a thing? Oh that no! Was so this was another adjustment. I, in right. my mind, I left the hospital thinking, oh well, I've I've broken my leg, I've broken my ankle, I've broken my collarbone in the past, of you know torn ligaments all over the place. Mm. I'll I'll be back. Yeah. Um, and three months later, I saw the consultant who had um, who I'd, 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 I'd been going to, and he said, "Come on, James, you need to get real. You can't play rugby again." Yeah. And I, I, that was again that was part of the loss of identity process. It was this this knowledge yeah. that I had lost this this thing that was probably the most important thing to me in yeah. the world outside of my outside of my relationships at the time, you know, family, family, friends, etc. That was my uh, yeah, as we've discussed, it was my it was my go to, it was my process, it was my routine, it was my my discipline, my motivation, and yeah. that was just you know st- stripped away in in one conversation. Um, and I sh- maybe I should have thought, uh, you know, that's that that's it. Maybe that that thought process should have should have gone through my mind, but I, maybe it did. Maybe I didn't want to believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that was that was a, that was another tough one. Yeah, that's tough. Okay. So anyway, sorry. So carry on with your your running journey then. Like, no, um, so that was well. The next the day, after watching this very you know heartwarming, um, moving uh, display of athleticism by the hordes running through the streets of London, I I got in touch with the charity and said I want to do it next year, and um, they said fine, great, um, okay, <laughs> and and it gave me that. That motivation it gave me that um, that discipline back because I was able to set myself a a schedule, a structure, a routine. Obviously, I hadn't run so you know the first day, the next day I was I was out walking a kilometer. The second week after that, I was walking two kilometers, and obviously, you gradually build it up um, over the over the, the course. Of, I mean, you, apparently, you can train for a marathon in three months. I um, I I I did it over a course of a year. Um, and yeah, and fast forward to the to the following April, I set off from um, uh, Blackheath, and f- four under four hours later, crossed the finish line in the, in, on the on the mile. And this this sense the sense of achievement, the the knowledge that I had set myself this this goal, what had seemed like an impossible feat for a basically a an overweight unfit alcoholic at the time the sense of achievement of having proved that proved myself to myself that that thought was was wrong and proved my to prove to myself that i could do it was 10 times better than anything i'd ever experienced on a rugby field that 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 sense of fulfillment that sense of achievement was just incredible yeah and well, the problem is that the problem was that I then started thinking, okay, well, I can run 26 miles. Maybe I can run a bit further. <laughs> um, and over the course of over the course of several years, I've just I've I've built it up and built it up and and done increasingly ridiculous and long distance and more and more arduous arduous challenges, um, which have turned yeah turned from from marathons into into ultra marathons and several marathons back to back in in one go yeah um which is but it's it's a it's remarkable as i say how the the amount of abuse that i put my had put my body through it's remarkable how the body can turn around and recover and come back and say no actually we can still we can still go out and we can still do these incredible things and yeah. as i say i'm fascinated by this concept of in, impossible um what seems impossible at the time actually if you break it down into digestible chunks and take on a little bit of a little bit at a time a lot of it's in the mind um and there's all sorts of all sorts of incredible 
stories over the years, the likes of Sir Roger Bannister running the the four minute mile. I don't know if you, yeah. I don't know how well you know that story, but people had been trying to run a mile in under four minutes for about a hundred years before he broke the the magic record, and it got to the point where I think I think it was a, a Swedish guy had got to four minutes and one second about ten years beforehand. So we're talking the nineteen forties, and it and it. It was the thought was that it was physically impossible to run a mile yeah. in under four in under four minutes, and that that's, that record that Swedish I think it was Swedish record stood for about ten years, until Roger Bannister on a wet day he was he was a student he was not coached, um, just went out and did it he was wearing like really? clunky old leather shoes I say it was a wet day, and off he went and he just thought well I can do it and off he did. And the mad thing is that about two weeks later, because that mental block was broken, that mental barricade, that mental hurdle was overcome, two weeks later, someone ran it even faster, having the, there having been a 10-year period where no one was able to do it. And you, the stories are the same with you know, Edmund Hillary and Everest and, and more recently, the, I don't know if you watched the, um, the, the Olympic, the marathon at the Olympics, the, 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 gold, the guy won gold, was a guy called Elliot Kipchoge. And he was the first man a couple of years ago to run a marathon in under two hours. Again, wow. no one thought it was possible. Yeah. Um, all these amazing, uh, Ross Edgeley, the guy who swam all the way around Britain. No, it's impossible. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. I can do it. Off, oh, Watch me. Took him five months or how, I mean, mad, mad story. I've got his book, but um, all these incredible stories of overcoming the supposedly or perceived impossible Um I think I think absolutely incredible, and I love the. Um, I have this I have this phrase. I don't, know, um, don't know if I should patent it or what, but um, the the contradiction of of human capability, in that on the one hand, the the body is incredibly fragile, and I know that from the injury that I sustained just you know, running into someone, albeit at a fairly significant, fairly significant amount of force, but I, I ran into someone and broke my neck. At the other end of that, that spectrum, the body is capable of these absolutely mind-blowing, incredible achievements if you're willing to just push it a little bit further than, than you think might be possible. Again, yeah. it's that, that, that possible and impossible um, divide. I, I find that whole thing absolutely fascinating. That's probably why you've done so many huge runs just to test what is in fact possible. So what is the definition of an ultra marathon? What is like the, the, the is there a technical so the, the, exact? Quite simply, the technical definition is anything further than a marathon. Right, okay. So a marathon is uh, 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers. An mm -hmm. ultra marathon basically starts at 45 kilometers, 50 kilometers, but it's then anything upwards from there yeah um and I've, I've slowly slowly built it up so uh three years ago it was the year after i did the london marathon i did um i did a 70 mile event across the, uh, the north of the country from carlisle to newcastle um that's so 70 miles and then uh do you September. stop for lunch on a 70 miler you you do have a few snack breaks along the way yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no i mean the, um I'll, I'll come on to the, the sort of physiology of a, an ultra marathon because again, and this is, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. I could talk about it for hours, but yeah, um, I did the, the 70 mile one. And then I've sort of always had this, this thought in the back of my mind, well, wow, wouldn't a hundred miles be incredible in one go. And that, that sort of that three digit figure became um, yeah. almost sort of sacred to me, I suppose. Uh, and last, I, I, I did it last, last September, I did an event called the Thames Path 100. I um, was very lucky that it went ahead what, with what with COVID, et cetera, but they spaced us all out and it was fine. Um, ran from Richmond to Oxford along the River Thames, um, which was 100 miles, um, which was, that took me 20, 20 hours. Um, that was flat. Um, I then... I was living in Wimbledon at the time. I then moved to, to Bath shortly afterwards and um, Bath's right down at the bottom of the Cotswolds and actually the Cotswolds way, I can see it, I'm pointing it in that direction, um, runs past the back of my flat. And nice. I, did a bit of, um, I did a bit of research and it turns out that the Cotswolds way is 102 miles long. Um, but 
with a total elevation of half the height of Everest up and down. Nice. Um, so I thought, well, that'll be my next challenge. Uh, I did that mm. in May. Uh, that took me just over 24 hours. Um, but again, a bit of research. I was the first person to do it. Uh, I did it on my own, put all of my calories in a rucksack and off I went. Did it, the first person to do it solo and unsupported. Alpine style. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of walking for that, for those, those <laughs> hills. The Cotswolds Way is basically a line through between here and Chipping Norton, but they've, um, sorry, Chipping Camden, but they've basically wiggled the line over every single hill between the two, um, between the two destinations. It's not a straight line. Um, so yeah, huge amount of elevation. And then, I mean, I don't know why, but um, uh, about six months ago, I signed up and I've just done it three weeks ago, signed up to another flat one, but a longer one uh, called the Kennet and Avon Canal Race, which was from London to Bristol. And that was yeah. 145 miles. 145. Um, so almost six marathons back to back, which took me just over 30 hours. Um, didn't sleep, ran through the night. Um, and I'm not a particularly fast runner. Um, I'm, I'm very much a plodder, but I managed to come second out of 75 people that started yeah. the thing. I was absolutely, absolutely blown amazing. away with that. I, was, I don't know quite how I did that, but anyway. Um, it's, <laughs> that is amazing, though. It's mindset. That is really amazing. It's, 30 uh, hours it took you. So what was your, like, not, not that I'm looking for problems here or anything like that, but what was your longest break? I just want to get into your mindset, like, when you're doing that. Like, how often and how long for do you so stop? So I, I sat down for probably, a, probably about 15 minutes at one point. It was probably the longest, longest stop. Really? They have various, various checkpoints along the way. Um, and you can refuel and, and um, um, get, get calories on board. And, and it's in, an incredibly important part of ultra, ultra marathon running is getting your, your calorie intake right. Um, a, fam a famous ultra marathon runner once said that an ultra marathon is, a, is, is, is a, an eating and drinking race with a little bit of running thrown in. Um, so you just, I mean, you're burning so many calories that you have to just, you're constantly grazing and snacking and eating and drinking and, and you have to get the balance right. You obviously don't want to eat too much because then you, your body, any your body starts complaining anyway, there's a big uh, sort of, you know, um, biology to it. Um, but yeah, about 15 minutes was the, uh, the longest I sort of sat down and, um, I had a bowl of, uh, rice pudding at about three o'clock in the morning at one of the checkpoints and, uh, sat there feeling sorry for myself for about three, about 15 minutes and thought, right, I should probably carry on yeah. um, and did. But it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's, I have this saying that once you can run a certain distance, you can run any distance. Mm -hmm. If you can run a marathon, you can run a hundred miles. I promise you it's, it's, it's just, it's just, the, it's just a mindset thing. Yeah, that 145 um, does it hits it hits my mindset in the sense I'm like I just don't see how you know that's just crazy to do it, it with it, with these tiny little breaks of like 15 minutes you know that's the bit that I'm like whoa like so yeah <laughs> I mean that crazy. was the 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 hundred mile the 200 mile runs the Thames and the, the Cotswolds Way were were tough and uh, yeah absolutely yeah. they were incredibly tough um, but. It was only, if, it, if, that, if I can use that word, it was only 24 hours, right? Um, and I got home the next day and went straight to bed and was sort of made, able to, to recover over a reasonably short period of time. Um, the 145 miler was another level. It took me about a, yeah. week, a week to get over that. I was just constantly tired for about a week afterwards. I was mm. sort of sleeping 15 hours at a time for several days afterwards. Just took everything everything out of me um yeah. mentally and physically um but, the, but as, as i say the, the mental side is more important than the physical side believe it or not you don't have to be that physically fit to run a marathon or an, or an ultra marathon you don't have to be mo farah i am not a natural runner if that if, if i can say that i'm six foot five i'm too tall i'm too heavy um, I've still got a slight sort of rugby bulky frame, which I sort of lumber around, um, uh, on these things, but it's, it's just, if, if, if you sit, if you sit down at the beginning of one of these, or stand there at the beginning of one of these races and think to yourself, oh my God, I've got to run 145 miles. You'll never do it. If you just think, right, all I've got to do is just put one foot in front of the other 
it suddenly becomes more manageable. Or and actually five you miles. Can, you, if you do f- five, five kilometers at a time, exactly. You do, oh, I'll just do one more kilometer. And then, <laughs> and in fact, actually, if you inject a sort of, if you inject a bit of a sense of humor into it, it, it becomes a bit, it becomes a bit of fun, actually. Now, it sounds like a really bizarre thing to say, but I've got one of these tracking watches and 145 miles was 200 and it does it in kilometers because it, I, I do it in kilometers because they, they seem to go quicker. Um, <laughs> but I think it was about 235 kilometers and my watch, so I set it off when I started and six minutes later it, it buzzed and it told me that I'd done one kilometer. And I thought, oh, great. And I sort of chuckled to myself, only 234 to go. And I, and I can remember having a little giggle to myself. And the next three, four kilometers were quite enjoyable, whilst I thought, oh, wasn't that funny? <laughs> and then after five kilometers, I thought, oh, great. I've done five kilometers. I only need to do that however many. I don't, you know, my math isn't good enough to divide 235 by five. But I only need to do that X number of times again in order to, to cross the finish. And again, it was a sort of little, little chuckle, uh, sort of li- these little wins that you, that you take. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, in, it's intriguing. The whole concept of physical versus mental fitness. Mm. Um, and I, I, so to sort of, I t- mentioned the, um, the sort of physiology of ultra running, if I can bore you with, with, with this. Um, I think of it as like a pie chart and I've got this little acronym camp C A M P P. Right. And I break it, break it down into these five elements. There's calories, there's admin as in your sort of how you look after yourself. There's mental fitness, physical fitness and pacing. Right. Um, and I say the calories, you've got to make sure that you're, you, you can run probably, I don't know, 20 miles without having anything to eat, at which point your body just has no, physical no, and your glucose levels aren't yeah. sufficient for you to continue uh, yeah, exercising so you've got to keep the energy coming you've got to keep your salts up so you prevent you, you don't overhydrate you don't prevent cramp it's all these things so it's, it's a bit of a science to that but you that just comes with the practice <coughs> excuse me um admin same you've just got to look after yourself you've got to wear the right shoes you've got to prevent blisters you've got to make sure that you i'd sort of lube myself up with coconut oil everywhere before i do these things so so that nothing chafes um, and they smell nice and I, and, and I smell incredible you're right yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> and there's this amazing stuff called gurney goo which is a sort of anti-blister gel that i'd lather all over them all over nice. my feet and it's sort of waterproof and all this stuff so you just plasters all this you look after yourself basically um i'll come back to the mental physical fitness i mean you've obviously got to be relatively fit but i say it's not the most important element pacing you don't want to get your heart rate up too high you want to stay within what's called your aerobic threshold rather than your anaerobic threshold so you're using oxygen to produce energy rather than um, rather than relying on um, uh, your, your, your body, body processes to, to produce, um, produce the energy. Um, all those four sections of the pie chart are probably 10% each. The, the, the mental is, is probably the rest of the 50%, oh, 60%. I'm terrible master. So um, it's just the ability to understand and tell yourself, convince yourself, that if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other for however long it takes, you will get over that finish line. And the, the point of all of this is and people are thinking, well, I'm, I'm never going to run an ultra marathon. That's absolutely fine. I, I, it's a fairly nuts thing to do. The point of this is that that counts for any, anything in life. Mm. Right? If you just keep telling you a deadline at work, if you're saving to buy a car, if you're trying to get your, I don't know, homeschooling your kids in lockdown, you know, all of this stuff that we've had to put up with through, uh, throughout the last 18 months is slowly coming to an end, we, we hope. Um, if you're able to tell yourself that just getting through one little thing at a time, metaphorically putting one foot in front of the other, the end, the end you, can see, you, know, you can see the end. And it comes yeah. back to my, my marathon, year-long marathon training that schedule of breaking things down into digestible chunks, putting, gradually building things up again, putting one foot in front of the other. It's, it's just, it's so relevant in, in all walks of life. 
Um, yeah. And, I, and I, I'm just, yeah, I love the power of the mind in helping us get through, get through challenges. Yeah, no, I do agree completely. And I think with the breaking things down, 145 would be straight up impossible if you didn't break that down there's in many that word, different ways. There's that right? word again. Yeah, there's that word. <laughs> you is, need the, but I mean, you need the mentality, yeah, to like take it from impossible tell, to possible. You, you need to break you, it down. I'll tell you a funny, funny story. And I, I mean, I don't, you, know, you might want to cut this because I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I've just, <laughs> my, my wife and I've just bought a new car and, um, we was I was sat chatting to the salesman yesterday. I just went in to sign some papers and went to the local dealership to sign some papers. And he, he asked me about because I'm in Bath now, I mentioned. So the big rugby presence in the in the local town. He asked me if I was into rugby. And I said, Yeah, yeah. He asked me if I played. I said, No, I'd had an injury, but I do I do long distance running instead now. And he said with this sort of big smile on his face, like as if he was super proud. And it was the most like the longest distance that anyone could run feasibly in 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 the world he said oh i know someone who once ran 35 miles and i said that's incredible um and i probably should have kept my mouth shut but i just couldn't resist <laughs> i said i said guess how what guess what the furthest i've ever run is and he he, he, he did, didn't come out with a figure but i eventually volunteered at the 145 mile figure and the look on his i mean i just do it for the look on people's faces that's why <laughs> that's why i do it it's sort of you know jaw dropped um yeah and he said, he said, surely that's impossible. That, those were his words. Um, and it just comes back to what you've, what you've just said a moment ago. If you think to yourself, running 145 miles, yeah, it seems impossible, doesn't it? But actually, yeah. if, you, if you just, I mean, I, my watch told me I did 243,000 steps. If you just do, you know, one Quarter step a million steps. and then another and then another and then another, eventually you'll get there. And yeah. as I say, it's, it's a metaphor it's a metaphor for life. I, um, yeah. the power of it is, 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 is really quite something. It's really quite something. And, and I, I also, again, I'm not suggesting that everyone goes out and runs ultra marathons. It's a fairly mad thing to do, but I always look at it as the experience of going through it is, is what I call life in a day. Cause you have these incredibly draining lows like ultra you've never felt as awful as at sort of three o'clock in the morning when you're hungry and it's raining and it's dark and it's you're in the middle of nowhere in the in the you know in the countryside somewhere um but if you're able to get through that like in any you know challenge or setback that we have in life generally then the high is is so much more as well you know you've got this it's just accentuated ups and downs um these yeah. catastrophic lows valley-like tumultuous lows and then these like, absolute sky high feelings of um achievement and fulfillment when you when you when you cross the finish line and it's just yeah. it's indescribable how how good it feels to do something like that mm. um it's like mountaineering isn't it's, it? it's exactly the same yeah it's a bit, it's relative for everyone if you've never run a five kilometers you know, doing a couch to 5k, the sense of achievement of that is, mm. is, is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's, you know, it's, it's overcoming whatever um, obstacle or setback you have personally in your, your life. And, and it could be coronavirus, it could be cancer, it could be struggling at work, it could be, like, you know, there's so many, so many could be launching a podcast and, and not getting enough listeners. I don't know what it might be. Um, so many examples, if you're able to just, I'm, I'm repeating myself now, but if you're able to just keep going, put that foot, one foot in front of the other over and over again, you, you will get there. Baby steps. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Like I say, it's the only way I can even begin to comprehend somebody running 145 miles in one go is breaking it down. So there you go. It has to, you have to break it down and, and look at it bit by bit. It's again, it's mindset. Um, and it is, there is a biological sort of element to this um, in that there is this, um, it's called central governor theory, which is, whereby, and I hope I'm explaining this right, is whereby the basically the body effectively shuts down if it thinks it's overexerting itself, um, if it thinks it's fatigued. Um, but the key word in that is think, mm. because no one actually scientifically knows what fatigue is. It, it can't be proven because it's in the mind. This is the, this is the point. 
Um, and if you get to a point, there's this old, um, the, the, the special forces use it, and, and this links to SAS Who Dares Wins. The special forces use this mantra that if you think you're tired and you think your, you know, your, your tanks are, are empty, you've actually got about 60% left in the tank. That's what they, mm. that's what they say. It's a 40, 60 rule. Um, and the central governor theory is, 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 is there's, um, there's sort of two sides of it. There's what's called homeostasis, where your body is in a, a state of equilibrium, I suppose is the best word, where your heart rate is normal, your breathing rate is normal, your digestive system is working correctly. Um, rest and digest is the, the sort of the, the, the other way of calling it. Um, once your body comes out of that and starts getting uncomfortable, your, your brain starts firing and triggering these these reactions these impulses to slow down to, to stop it's a protective device um that yeah but it basically protects us from from overexerting ourselves but it's possible yeah. to train your mind a bit like any sort of muscle in the body it's possible to train your mind to overcome that and if you get that feeling of fatigue to think actually no hang on a minute i can you know i'm knackered but i can just put one foot i can make one more step and if i can make one more step i can make two i can make 10 i can make 100 um again it's the you know it's really, you know, if, you, if you're able to run 26 miles you, you're able to run 27 what 28 30 why not 145 where's the limit yeah um and a friend actually that i just just did the 145 miler with i was texting earlier he says he's just signed up for a 200 mile one i mean rather him than me but it just it shows that it shows that, you, that there is there is effectively no limit, and I'm fascinated yeah. by this again impossible um, concept by the the idea of boundaries by by the idea of limits um, and how far we can we can push ourselves. I've actually told my wife that I will retire from all of this stuff. So I'm, uh, um, I as I say, my, my, the, the guy I mentioned um, can can go off and do this 200 miler. Yeah, good good luck to him, but. Uh, uh, it does. It does fascinate me how we're we're very quick to limit ourselves and tell it tell ourselves. Um, oh, I mean this. Yeah, this is a this is a very interesting point. I, I mean, I talk about doing these these mad these mad runs. A very common response that I get, and it's almost instantaneous. It's almost like a instant reaction like without without thinking about it people will say oh wow i could never do that well why not you know why is that your instant thought mm. why why is that the first thing that pops into your head and if i look back eight years ago five years ago um if someone had told me you know you're going to run 145 miles in in five years time i would have said no don't be stupid that's ridiculous i would have probably had the same thought process but we're very quick, very quick to limit ourselves without actually thinking through how we might go about something. And if you're, if you're telling yourself you can't run a marathon or an ultra marathon, as an example, again, as a sort of metaphor, what, what else are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself that you can't be happy? You can't be successful. You can't have a nice car. If, if that's something that's important to you, you can't, you know be 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 good at your job you, you can't be good in your relationship what how else is your brain thinking in that your brain's yeah. thinking in that negative negative way how else are you limiting yourself does that make does that make sense yeah 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 i see what you're saying definitely i mean it's all mentality isn't it every way we interact with with our lives everything we do every day it has an impact, doesn't it, on on how you move forward and what you're chasing and all that kind of thing. Mm, yeah, and, so, and yeah. I, it also it comes down to the we've got this um, understanding of of mental health um, as a bad thing because of the connotations, the stigma of mental ill health. But mental health isn't actually a bad thing. Um, it, it's a, there's a confusion with, I suppose, if you want to phrase it better you'd say mental fitness. Yeah. And it's, that is about seeing things in a, a positive light. It's not about, you know, it's not about being happy, clappy about everything, but it is about seeing the, a positive side of things rather than that instantaneous, oh, I could never do that. And it's yeah. about building resilience to, to manage 
life's ups and downs. You know, we all have challenges, but rather than instantaneously thinking, oh, I can't, you know, oh, I can't do this. If, if you're able to think, hang on, actually, hang on a minute, there's going to be a way of solving this. There's going to be a way of working through the problem. You might need to bring other people in to, to support you. It all links into your know, relationships, being kind to others. All of the, you know, it's all sort of um, linked together in this incredible um, smorgasbord, I suppose, for um, how our mind works and that mental fitness uh, rather than mental health concept uh, can improve our productivity at work. It can make us feel happier. You know, that all sounds possibly a little bit fluffy and lovey-dovey, but it's, it's true. It can actually bring us great fulfillment in life if we look at things slightly, slightly differently, rather than this automatic negativity, if we're able to just flip that and, and, and look at things in a slightly more positive light as to how we can go about things rather than how we can't, as I say, like life is, life just becomes a hell of a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 No, definitely. And, and feeling that kind of contentment and confidence will go a long way to, yeah, how you, how things go for you, you know, cause somebody's more likely to smile at somebody that looks happy. And so then you feel a bit more happy and it's all that kind of circle, which can go negatively or positively. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, mental, I, I, I work in mental health and I'm very privileged to do so because I find it so, um, so, so, so fascinating. But as you say, smiling at people and uh, this comes on to the sort of openness, honesty, vulnerability, conversation but you know just the simple act of asking someone how they are and allowing them to give you an answer giving them that space and, and giving them permission to to answer you back is one of the most powerful conversations that we can have we're, we're far too quick to say oh how are you fine yeah you yeah good yeah and that's it you move on whereas actually if you ask probably 95 percent of people and ask it in the right way that, that there's always going to be 5% that'll say, yeah, fine, brush off, brush it off because they just don't want to talk about these things. But if you give the vast majority of people the time and the space to, to actually think, mm. contemplate, reflect, you, you know, self-awareness is very, very um, powerful. Metacognition is the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the scientific phrase, the sort of the thinking about thinking. Um, if you give people space to do that and actually the, 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 the platform um, for them to be open and express themselves, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And we, we, we simply don't do enough of it as a, um, as a society. Yeah, I think it's still a lot of people probably just still don't feel comfortable yet answering it honestly, do they? We still need to break down a lot of barriers for people to feel more able to be honest i guess as much as asking the question it goes the other way like people need to feel like they have the license to answer it don't they we do um, yeah they do um and it comes because that's probably the most common lie that yeah, yeah right yeah, 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 absolutely. Good you, it like, is a lie in most, most cases yeah. you're absolutely right i mean <laughs> yeah. some some people might have had the absolute best morning in the ever it, it's yeah. it's bloody rare though you know kids yeah. might have played up the car didn't start your boss has shouted, I don't know what it might be. You know, there's so many scenarios. Um, there's always, there's always a little something that's just going to niggle and just affects you and, and get in the, maybe you've had a, um, an argument with your, your, your better half or, or whatever it might be, but yeah, it's it, a lie is a very interesting way of, way of, way of putting it. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's jump on to talking about that SAS who yeah. knows wins. And before we go into talking about the actual experience, how did you decide you wanted to do that? I mean, I guess it's not really a big jump from being the guy that wants to run a hundred miles in one go to wanting to go and put yourself through hell on a TV show. Right? So, no, I mean it, it's, it's similar <laughs> put it, pushing yourself through brutality kind of kind of concept, isn't it? Yeah, I um, I'd run a couple of the the longer so longer than the marathon i'd run a couple of ultras and just the, the, in terms of the time frame it, it just came up i'd watched the previous season and uh, at the end there was this uh, and loved i'd watched all uh, i was on season four and i'd watched the previous three seasons loved them all but every single every time thought man i can't you know not going to get around to that um but at the end of season three there was a flashed up on the screen. If you want to take part in the next one, send an email to 
Channel 4, apply at Channel 4, it probably was, I don't know. And I thought, well, why the hell not? Because I was going through this, this recovery process and, and wanting to push myself and test my limits. And it, you know, it is the ultimate program for a civilian to, 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 to get that experience. Um, and, and it is, you know, money can't buy kind of, kind of stuff, you know, you're flying around in helicopters and jumping off bridges and swimming in glacial lakes. Well, we did, I mean, it was all crazy, wonderful stuff. Um, yeah. but yeah, in short, I got, I got an email back saying, we'd like you to come for a, um, sort of mocking. I had to do a fitness test and get a certain level on the bleep test and do a certain number of press ups and sit ups in two minutes, I think, and um, then do an interview. And I sort of told them my story, and I think they liked the fact that I was the uh, sort of the public school um, tough kind of oh dear kind of uh, kind of guy. And and about half an hour into the actual thing, Aunt Middleton shouted at me, so he called me posh boy within about half an hour or something like that. anyway. Um, but yeah, they just, they liked my story and, and I say yeah. I was, I was lucky cause 5,000 people applied and, um, they whittled us down to 25 and off we flew to Chile. Um, we didn't know where we were going. We arrived at the airport, um, and, and we were sort of whisked away and through two weeks of spending, um, yeah, spending two weeks, 3000 meters up the Andes in minus five, minus 10 degrees, um, temperatures and diving in and out of rivers and lakes and hiking logs up hills and um, running away from armed militia and sniffer dogs and put, being put through uh, put through interrogation and stress positions, um, which was awful. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. The rest of it was incredible. The stress positions weren't. As someone so that was the worst bit. That was the hardest bit for for me personally. So, I mean, I can't speak for everyone because um, what exactly was the position, and and how long did you have to stay in them, and that kind of thing? So they varied them. Um, you had to stand in a sort of star shape with your hands on the wall, and then you had to ha- hold your your hands out in front of you. But it was basically, uh, I mean, you're in pain about two minutes after starting one of these positions, and they make you do it for half an hour, forty five minutes. I know I lost all concept of time. But I yeah. did. I did about six hours of this, and, and, I, uh, and then they're playing um, baby screaming noises mm. in earphones, and women crying, and pigs snuffling, and and, and you're sort of hallucinating because you haven't eaten or drunk anything for the past twelve, um, twenty four hours. Um, all of the, actually the the noises and the. The, I'm, I'm usually I'm usually I need my I usually need a need a good feed every sort of two or three hours, but I was able to able to um, survive through being hungry for for, um, for for that period of time. But it was just that the position really took a strain on my on my neck, uh, and I got to a point where I just thought I'm I'm causing myself permanent damage here. There's there's no point. Um, yeah, I mean I was I was proud of of how well I did. There were eight of us out of twenty five that got through to that section of the yeah. that stage of the you know, the last day or so of the of the process um and the guys who went through and and passed the selection um ended up doing about 18 hours worth of stress positions which i i, I just I, That's I, 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 no, no thank you um <laughs> no. but it again it comes back to this mindset mindset thing mm. And this yeah. this attitude that, that I mentioned, this sort of special forces attitude, where if you if you think you're you're tired and fatigued and, and done, actually you've got more in the tank, more in reserve that you can that you can tap into if if you if you learn how to do it. And they weren't the the DS um, for anyone who's not not seen the show. It's run by four former um, special forces operatives. Uh, called the directing staff, the DS. They're not looking for the the fastest, the fittest, the strongest, the most charismatic leader in the process. They're just looking for the person who's just, who's going to keep going, no matter what you you throw. Mm. You, you know, you could be five foot tall, you could be seven foot tall. It doesn't matter if you are able to just put one foot in front of the other. Whether you're hiking a um, a hundred kilo log up a mountain or 
walking over a ladder suspended over a 200 meter drop into a ravine i saw that yeah. um which was cool by the way um <laughs> i love all that like adrenaline stuff so i was i was yeah. uh, i was like a kid on sweets when they got to do that sort of stuff that was great um and like running forwards down abseiling down the cliff face, forwards down cliff faces and stuff like that but if you're able to overcome if you've got a fear of heights but you're able to climb something. If you've got a fear of water, but you're able to swim something. If you know, if you're able to just get on with it without complaining, um, even if you're, if you even if you come last, um, if you if you're struggling, but are able to push through, that's what they're looking for, for rather than as I say, just being the fittest or the or the strongest. Um, so yeah. it's an interesting take on again that the sort of that human capability. Um, I mean, I was, I was for, fortunate. Is that the right word? I was big. I was strong. So carrying some of the, you know, the weights that they made us carry up hills was easier for me than it was for some of the 50, yeah. 60 kilo girls that, that, that you made some of it look easy. I have to say like right. some of the <laughs> physical stuff they got you to do. It looked like you weren't really that's, struggling that much. That's, like, uh, that's very kind. I was, no. <laughs> that's very kind. Um, you hit it well. The fi- you know, funnily the, it was brutal. The physical side of it was brutal, but I was able to just get my head down and think I can do this and get it done. Yeah. One um, the, other. the mental side of it was fascinating because we never knew what was coming next. So for, mm. for 12, 14 days, it was just constantly on edge. Like uh, just like adrenaline searing through me pretty much 24 seven for two weeks, barely slept a wink in two weeks. Um, uh, you know, I came home an absolute shell of a human being. Um, there was that sort of constant anxiety. I, you, they'd give us, uh, you know, we'd come back to our sort of accommodation barrack thing and be told to chill out. Well, we couldn't chill out because we didn't know if they would come burst, come, yeah. would come bursting through the door five minutes or two hours later telling us to go on to the next thing. And would, um, would they mess with you like that? Would they come in in the middle of the night or in the middle of like when some people are chilling and they're just like, right, let's go. Every single night, every night <laughs> and three times a day probably. So yeah. we'd, we'd, and this is because they have to condense 14, yeah. 14 days. Um, and there was probably a two or three hour period of time in the middle of the night where, where we, we weren't made to do something. But effectively, so let's say you know, 20 hours a day for 14 days, they have to condense that into six 45-minute episodes. They obviously can't show everything. Um, and what they didn't show was that every night they would shut all our lights off at about 10 o'clock. We'd sort of start trying to doze off. At midnight, they'd all come back on again. We'd be marched into the parade square and made to do press-ups in the snow, then sent oh. back to bed at 1 o'clock. We had to do this system of night watch throughout the night where we had to, like, on a rotor, we each had to spend an hour sat in like this hole in the ground, making notes of like a wild dog walking across the parade square, like 302 wild dog walks across parade square. 316 cameraman goes to the loo. 345. Like it was just, it was absolute nonsense. They didn't, yeah. they didn't use it. It was just to get into our heads and keep us, keep us tired the whole time. So yeah. you've got broken sleep every single night. Um, they, they didn't fit. I probably, I was probably at 1500, 2000 calories a day. Um, I mean, I usually eat about 3000, three and a half thousand just because of my size. That's not a yeah. brag. I just, I eat a lot, <laughs> um, and exercise a lot. Um, so I lost six kilos in two weeks. Um, and it's just all these wow. elements that you just yeah. don't, they, they don't show on TV because they can't. Um, and people often ask, you know, was it as, was it as brutal as it looks? on TV. And my answer is always no, it was more brutal, 10 times more brutal because they, they don't yeah. show everything that they, um, they don't show everything. They don't show, you know, the fact that we're starved and sleep deprived. And it sounds like absolutely hideous. I would do it again tomorrow, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was an incredible experience. Um, taught me a lot about, you know, coming back to this sort of impossibility limits concept um i'm still great friends with 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 the guys i did it with we go off on um adventures we climb snowden together and and, and do oh, things cool. like that so we you know we're all yeah. similar of a similar ilk um and like the, the sort of the great outdoors um and yeah no it, it was a really remarkable experience and i got to fly around 
the Andes in a helicopter, which was pretty cool as well. So yeah, yeah. No, it seems like it was really awesome, like hellish, uh, hellish, like physically and, and mentally. But but apart from that, like uh, yeah, again, it's it's how you look at these things, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you look at a one hundred and forty five mile run as being the most god awful thing that you know humanity could throw at you then it's going to be the most god awful thing that you can imagine self-fulfilling prophecy whereas if you say actually this is going to be i'm going to enjoy this and i'm going to take in nature and sort of think you know let my mind go and use it as a mindfulness experience and i use running as a sort of meditation um then it's it it is despite you know it it hurting it's an enjoyable experience the same was Mm. the case with sas who dares wins i'm really into the sort of I've been, you know, bungee jumping and skydiving and all of these silly uh, adrenaline things. I quite like the the rock climbing, abseiling, jumping off bridges element of it. That I found those quite those activities quite cool. Um, the fitness sort of physical um, tasks were were hard, but again, I sort of thought to myself get on with it and i was three thousand meters up the andes in beautiful scenery so it wasn't the worst place yeah. to do a you know do a um the equivalent of a of a hit class or something like that um so i have only got fond memories of it despite the fact that it was the hardest thing i've ever done actually what were the ice pools like and what was this oh, other hardest thing you've ever done that well, you were i was just about to say, say running 145 miles was the hardest yeah, thing I've ever right, done. Okay. but so um yeah um, but over a shorter period of time rather than a two week. Anyway, um, the, the ice pools, I mean, again, it's, this might sound a bit odd, they but I used, I used to take ice baths after rugby games. So I sort of, I wasn't really bothered by it. It was cold, but there's a way of, you basically have just have to calm yourself down. You slow down your breathing. Um, and after, you know, if after a, the initial shock of, of, of the cold hitting you, actually it's, it's bearable. Um, so, I mean, I'm making it sound like it was a walk in the park. It most <laughs> definitely wasn't. Um, Action man over here. God, just no, just no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you, you want to talk to Mark who passed the thing. He was, he was the action man. He was awesome. Um, yeah. But um, it, it, was, it wasn't a case of it being a walk in the park. It was a case of it being doable with the right mindset. And it yeah. comes back, no, it comes back to this, this mindset thing. If you look at it, and again, if you look at it thinking, oh God, this is going to be absolutely horrible, it will be. But if you look at it as it's going to be a life-changing experience and teach me all the things I need to know about myself and um, blah, 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 um, like you say, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. No, no, you got the right way of looking at it, James, that's for sure. Um, look, I'm a little bit conscious of the time. So tell me a little bit about, firstly, the charity, yeah. you, or not necessarily firstly, but your charity and also this this expedition adventure that you're planning with your new wife yeah, uh, very, later this very year. very kind of you to allow me to plug it. So all of the the, the long run, the, the London to Bristol 145 mile run, um, as well as a couple of other challenges I did earlier in the year are all to raise money for children with cancer UK. Uh, 12 children are diagnosed with cancer every single day uh, in the UK. And that is obviously on top of all of the, we've all been going through these incredible problems for the last 18 months or so. But I I do think that we've forgotten about some of the other problems that are going on in the world, like um, illness um, in in, in children. So I think it's a very important cause. Um, I have raised ten and a half thousand pounds already, which is which nice. is incredible. People have been incredibly yeah. generous, especially given I haven't been able to go out into the streets and collect money in tins and things like that. It's all been, you know, online donations, which has been been wonderful. So um, very grateful um, to people for that. But there's still money to. I've, um, we've I said we have. I say we have. Uh, I'll explain why. Um, set a, a target of twelve thousand pounds. So there's still some, um, still a bit of bit of a way to go. But if we can get more than that, fantastic. Uh, I say we because I am dragging my my wife uh, of a month into uh, into this. We got married a month ago against all the odds with COVID. Um, but she is 
incredible. She's almost as mad as I am. And we agreed for our honeymoon rather than, uh, I mean, obviously I don't drink, so sipping cocktails is not relevant to me, but she enjoys a cocktail or two. Rather than sitting on a beach in the Maldives sipping cocktails, we would uh, tick off one of our hit list donation uh, destinations, which is Patagonia. And we have signed up to do an expedition for our honeymoon. Let me just stress. Um <laughs> 360 kilometers across Patagonia in six days, running, cycling, and kayaking. Did I mention that that's our honeymoon? Um, <laughs> so yeah, if anyone can spare a penny or two, that would be incredibly appreciated. My social media is at James Gwinnett, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and my, um, the donation page is in my bio. If you're not on social media, it's just giving Dot com. I'll put it in oh, this yeah. description yeah. anyway, but just giving.com just slash... giving com forward slash Gwinecki. And that's a combination of our surnames, even though we now have the same surname because obviously we just got married, but it's G W I N N E C K Y just giving.com okay, forward cool. slash. That. But yeah, um, you should be able to just scroll down and find that anyway. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. So yeah, yeah, thank you for, for, for squeezing that in. Um, yeah. That's I mean, cool. that's, uh, that'll be the sort of the, the, climax of a, a, a fairly, mile fairly incredible fairly incredible year triathlon. 360 kilometers um yeah sorry Ed. <laughs> uh, 600 miles would be wow um, <laughs> i don't know where i plucked yeah. that one from yeah oh don't, yes don't, don't 600 miles don't tempt me that'll be the, that'll be the next one um yeah no i've, I've told her I've promised her bless her she's she she comes with me on these um these long distance runs and, and helps and crews for me and sort of um, brings me watermelon and all, you know, coconut water and all this sort of stuff. In fact, it was um, on the London to Bristol run. It was, it was in the middle of that heat wave um, a month ago. I don't know if you, don't know if you remember, it was 28 degrees um, running 145 miles in 28 degree heat. And then actually there was a thunderstorm in the middle of the night. Um, so it wasn't ideal conditions, but anyway, she was bringing me ice lollies along the way. So bless her. She, she is incredible. She comes sort of with me every single step of the way. And then eventually it gets to sort of 11 o'clock at night. And I say, right, go home and sleep and I'll continue running. She's, in, she's wonderful. She's so supportive. Um, we really are a, a match made in heaven, as they say. Um, but I have, awesome. I have promised her that I'll rain, rain these things back in, so that she doesn't have to. Are you going to? For real? To... Are you going to stop the ultra marathon? <clears throat> I, uh, I might limit myself to sort of fifty kilometers. I think is probably a sensible. Um... It's all in the wording. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, on a serious note, you know, we're married now. We do want kids, and um, I talk about going on adventures, and the next adventure will be starting a family and and that will be yeah. a focus next year and i'm you know i'm i do everything that i do 110 percent, whether it's running an ultra marathon or we will we will see raising a raising a family or, or or whatever it might be but we've we've talked about um getting a uh, a dog and starting a family so that'll be i think that'll be the adventure um from, yeah. from you know for 2022 and, and and onwards with the occasional shorter in inverted commas um run yeah. thrown thrown in but yeah no. you get it out of your way on that honeymoon i suppose <laughs> exactly yeah that'll be the uh <laughs> that's probably the idea that's that, why she's agreed to do yeah it. you're right yeah that'll be the swan song i suppose <laughs> of uh, the uh the the retirement um go out in style <laughs> event yeah no, that'll be amazing. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, look, there's one last thing I'm going to ask you to do. No pressure here, but I'm just going to put you on the spot a little Ooh, bit. Right. Um, <laughs> no, not really. Just a message that you want to give to anybody watching or listening. It doesn't have to be about anything in particular. Um, I'm sure you've got loads up there rattling around that you want to that you want to send out. So anything, anything that is you want a good it to one. Be. Yeah, and like you say, where do I where do I start with that one? First message: donate to a wonderful cause. Um, if, if you can spare it. No, I think it's sort, of, it's the sort of question, you know, what would you tell a young James kind of question, isn't it? Um, that, kind of, that kind of thing, I guess. It'd probably be along the lines of don't limit yourself. Um, you know, we comes, I've, I've harped on about it to the point of um, excessive repetition for the last hour or so. We, we have this idea of, and perception of what is possible versus impossible in our in our brains and we have this very um overridingly negative spin on that 
um, and it prevents us from achieving our goals, whatever those goals might be. Um, if you're able to flip that and remove that thought process, that negative thought process, and convince yourself that effectively anything is possible, if you're able to remove remove those limits, then life is a hell of a lot. Life can be a hell of a lot easier, um, and actually, you can find a great deal of as I have in the last five years since, since giving up, giving up drinking, you can find a, a lot of satisfaction, purpose, fulfillment and enjoyment rather than this, this sort of day-to-day stress of, of, of worrying about what's next. You can um, and live, living in the present as well as another one, you know, don't, don't spend too much time looking, looking forward to what's coming and fearing the future, live in the moment, find the, find that space comes, comes back to that conversation we were having about, you know, open, openness and honesty about how you're, how you're feeling and about how are you conversation, a bit of self-awareness, living in the moment, living in the here and now rather than worrying too much about the future. So yeah, don't limit yourself and live in the here and now. Awesome. There you go. I knew you'd have something. See, oh, that was really I good. Managed to <laughs> managed to waffle one out. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Well, thanks again so much for today, James. Really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to that episode with James Gwinnett. Check out the description for all of his links plus our own. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please consider subscribing and telling a friend to look us up. Be nice. Be curious. Be cool.